this video we'll cover the development and health topic in higher geography. So this includes development indicators, explaining the differences in levels of development between developing countries, the study of a water-related disease, the causes, the impacts and management, and primary healthcare strategies. When we talk about development and geography, we mean how economically, culturally, socially and technologically developed a country is. So generally in a developed country, you'd expect most people to have a high quality of life. Quality of life is a difficult thing to measure and quantify. So development indicators are things that we can measure that give us an indication of the quality of life in that country. For higher geography, you need to be able to explain why these measures give an indication of the quality of life. These indicators can be economic or social. I will give a couple of examples, but you need to be able to explain two or three economic and two or three social indicators of development. One example of an economic indicator of development is gross domestic product per capita. This is the total value of goods and services produced by a country divided by the number of people in the country. You could think of GDP per capita as being roughly the amount of money made by the average person in the country in a year. When GDP per capita is high, this suggests that the country has a lot of industry because manufactured goods sell for a higher price on the world market. It also suggests that the country has enough money to buy machinery to replace labour intensive, repetitive or dangerous jobs. The money can also be spent to improve people's quality of life. For example, by spending money on healthcare and clean water supplies, fewer people will become ill or die from preventable diseases. As well as improving individuals' lives, this also increases their productivity and will lead to higher incomes in the future. Having money to spend on education will hopefully mean that in the future, better educated citizens will gain higher paid work and will start to have families later, bringing down the birth rate. An example of a social indicator of development is life expectancy at birth. That is the average number of years that a newborn is expected to live if the current mortality rate continues. A low life expectancy suggests poor health care as more people die from treatable injuries or conditions and a lack of vaccination programmes results in preventable diseases circulating in the community, such as polio or measles. A low life expectancy also suggests that there might be high levels of malnutrition. A poor diet leads to a weaker immune system and it becomes difficult to fight off infection and recover from diseases, increasing the number of premature deaths. A low life expectancy also suggests low access to clean water and sanitation due to waterborne diseases such as cholera. Poor living conditions such as overcrowding can cause disease to spread quickly, again lowering the life expectancy. You also need to be able to explain why a development indicator may give a misleading impression of life in a country such as with this exam question. First of all, this question mentions GNI per capita which is very similar to GDP per capita, but also includes earnings from foreign investments. However, you could talk about GDP per capita or any other indicator you like, as the question says such as. GNI or GDP per capita can be misleading in a country with a few very rich people and a lot of poor people. An unequal distribution of wealth can mean that many people don't have access to services such as medical care and as a result have a poor quality of life. Also, GDP or GNI per capita are always expressed in US dollars, even though exchange rates fluctuate continually. Finally, GDP and GNI per capita do not take into account the informal economy. That's people who don't declare or pay tax on their earnings. This can generate a large proportion of wealth in some developing countries. They also don't include subsistence agriculture. You could also mention that composite indicators such as the Human Development Index or the Physical Quality of Life Index give a more rounded picture by combining a number of different indicators of development together. Individual developing countries can be at very different levels of development and you need to be able to explain why. You should explain each of your reasons and name countries where this applies. I will explain a couple of examples, but as you may get a question on this worth 12 marks, you should be able to explain more, maybe using some of the ideas on this slide. One physical factor that makes it difficult for some countries to develop is climate. Countries with an extreme climate can struggle to grow enough food for their population. For instance, in the Sahel region of Africa, very variable and low rainfall patterns leads to frequent droughts. This in turn means that famine is common, leading to malnutrition and loss of income. 
One human factor that has made it difficult for many developing countries is their history. For example, modern day Ghana was colonised by Britain. The profits from selling Ghana's raw materials, such as gold, diamonds and timber, went to Britain rather than developing Ghana. In addition, the borders of many African countries were agreed by European powers using rulers and maps without reference to cultural and tribal boundaries. For example, you can see that the border between Algeria and Mali is just a very straight line. Now we're going to look at the next part of this topic, health. For the water-related disease, I'm going to look at malaria. You may not have studied malaria, but it will still give you an idea of the level of detail that you need to include and the key points that you need to make in your answers. I'm going to start with the impact of malaria. In the exam, you may be asked about the benefits of being able to control the disease or alternatively, the costs of not doing so. And these are huge for both individuals and for countries. The first key impact is the human suffering caused by malaria. Due to strategies to manage malaria, which we will look at later, there has been a significant fall in the death rate over the past 15 years. However, numbers are still high. In 2019, 400,000 people died from malaria and about two thirds of these were children under the age of five. Many more people become ill with malaria and then recover. In 2019, some 220 million people became infected with malaria and 95% of malaria cases occur in sub-Saharan Africa. This puts an enormous burden on these countries. Spending money on medicine, drugs and doctors to look after the people who suffer from malaria means there is less money available to tackle other diseases or to invest in clean drinking water or sanitation. This means more people, especially children, die from other preventable diseases such as cholera or diarrhoea. Education also suffers as there is less money to invest in schools and children miss school due to episodes of malaria. This has an impact on earning power later on. Also, adults are unable to work during episodes of malaria, leading to lower incomes and lower productivity. Tourists and foreign investors avoid malarial areas, resulting in a fall of income, leading to lower foreign currency earnings, lost job opportunities and more poverty. You could be asked about the physical and human causes of the disease that you've studied. Again, I'm going to focus on malaria. Most people get malaria after being bitten by infected mosquitoes. Only certain species of the Anopheles mosquito can carry malaria, so this is the first physical cause. Before laying her eggs, the female Anopheles mosquito must get a blood meal and she prefers mammal blood such as humans. When the mosquito bites a person infected with malaria, the malaria parasite, which is called plasmodium, is in the blood that she drinks. So having plasmodium already present in an area is another physical cause of malaria. Once they've got some blood, female mosquitoes like to sit and digest in a shaded area before laying their eggs in stagnant water. This means having vegetation close to stagnant water makes the number of mosquitoes and the likelihood of catching malaria higher. Temperature also affects how long mosquito eggs take to hatch, which affects their numbers and whether they live long enough for the plasmodium parasite to become transferable, which takes up to two weeks. Temperatures of 16 to 40 degrees Celsius allow large numbers of mosquitoes to survive long enough to spread the disease. Moving on to human factors. Several of these, such as a poor water supply and people working near water, are to do with how much time people spend near stagnant water, which makes them more likely to be bitten. Low quality housing also makes it more difficult to keep mosquitoes out at night. Others are to do with the movement of the plasmodium, once a person infected with malaria travels to a new area, he or she may be bitten by a mosquito and start the spread of the plasmodium into a new area. Finally, a higher density of humans in an area makes it easier for malaria to spread. While mosquitoes do bite other animals, most other animals aren't hosts for malaria in the way that humans are. Another area that you might be asked about in your exam is explaining the solutions that have been tried to control the spread of your disease around the world. I'll go through a few examples relating to malaria, but as this question may be worth up to 20 marks, you should be able to explain numerous other examples, such as the ones on the following three slides. The solutions on this slide involve dealing with adult mosquitoes. For example, sleeping under an insecticide-treated bed net is the most widely used preventative measure against malaria. 
It's effective because the Anopheles mosquito bites only at night. The nets physically prevent mosquitoes biting people while the insecticide kills any mosquito that lands on the net. The insecticide also repels mosquitoes, decreasing the number that enter houses. Long-lasting insecticide treated nets are effective for about three years, even with repeated washing. If this time could be extended, insecticide treated nets would become cheaper and easier to maintain and more effective. One disadvantage with insecticide treated nets is that in some areas the mosquitoes are becoming resistant to the insecticide used, making them less effective. Other methods to tackle malaria target the mosquito larvae and eggs. One such method is to drain areas of stagnant water where the mosquitoes breed by putting lids on buckets left outside, draining pools or removing litter. While reducing the amount of stagnant water has been effective in reducing the number of mosquitoes, it's difficult to eradicate them completely as mosquitoes can breed in very small areas of water. Also, some water needs to be stored for irrigation and drinking. Finally, there are methods that target the plasmodium parasite rather than the mosquitoes. A vaccine called RTSS has been developed, which has been shown in clinical trials to reduce the risk of catching malaria by 40% in the four years following vaccination. The World Health Organization is currently running large-scale trials in three African countries to see how it will perform in the real world. The drawbacks of this method are that to achieve 40% protection, four doses are needed, with all the costs associated with providing and distributing this. 40% protection is also not very high, meaning that other methods such as sleeping under insecticide-treated nets and draining breeding areas need to be continued. The final part of this unit looks at primary healthcare. This is measures taken by developing countries to improve the health of as many people as possible. You need to be able to describe different methods and explain why they're effective. Primary healthcare includes anything that improves people's health. Providing clean drinking water and sanitation, for example, is primary healthcare. Again, I will give you a couple of examples of how you could explain these, but you will need to be familiar with more. One method to improve sanitation is to provide pit latrines. These are simply holes in the ground to collect human waste. Usually two holes are dug in each hut. One hole is used until it's full, then it's covered and the other hole is used. Meanwhile, the human waste in the first hole turns into fertilizer. There are a couple of reasons why this is an effective way of improving health. Firstly, it keeps human waste out of water, which people may use for drinking. Diarrhea is one of the leading causes of death in children under five in Africa. As well as preventing disease, pit latrines also produce fertilizer, which increases crop yields. More food means fewer people suffer from malnutrition and they have stronger immune systems to fight off diseases. People can also sell any excess crops, generating more income that can be spent on healthcare or education. Another method many developing countries have used to improve the health of their population is community health workers. In countries with large rural areas, it's difficult and expensive to ensure that every village has access to a doctor. To solve this problem, individuals are chosen by each community to be trained to a basic level of healthcare. These people act as a first point of contact for the village, giving first aid and referring more serious cases on to fully trained doctors. The benefits of this approach are that the health workers are known and trusted by the community, so their advice tends to be taken. It's also much cheaper than training and then paying a doctor. The final example of primary healthcare that I'm going to talk about is vaccination programmes against preventable diseases such as polio, measles and tetanus. Preventative healthcare such as vaccination is much cheaper than trying to cure someone once they have a disease. It's also extremely effective the World Health Organization estimates that two to three million lives are saved around the world each year due to vaccinations. Finally, here is a selection of exam questions from previous years. There's quite a limited number of questions that can be asked in the development and health topic, so practice with past exam questions will really pay off here.